Hello and welcome to the Classroom Professor Math Podcast. This program is designed to help you to prepare and teach mathematics more easily, efficiently and effectively, to truly engage your students in mathematical thinking and to develop their numeracy. Good day everyone, it's Peter Price and I'd like to welcome you to the Classroom Professor Math Podcast. This is episode three and the topic is number lines. Before I start, I'd like to thank you if you've already been one of those who've watched or listened uh, to the podcast. We're already ranking on iTunes and uh, we're really excited with uh, where this podcast may take us. So to begin today's topic, the key idea about a number line is that it can represent numbers analogically, which of course is a technical term referring to the fact that the size of the spaces along a number line can be used to represent the size of the differences between numbers um, in a physical form, representing numbers which of course are abstract. And so it's a really useful resource for bringing the abstract concepts that we want our students to understand, which is the numbers, into a physical and visual form that they can see and manipulate in different ways and so on. Now we know that numbers are an infinite set. They go of course from negative infinity to positive infinity. There's no limit to the number of numbers that there are. A number line is similarly not limited because you can choose which numbers are represented. Uh, we explain in geometry that a line has no end. Um, in using a number line in, uh, in, in a number lesson, we can choose any part of the sequence of numbers to be represented on the line. So they can be used for, for students from the very youngest age right up to very um, advanced maths. You can even use them to show um, irrational numbers like the square root of 2. You can do a geometrical construction and show how to actually locate the square root of 2, which is an irrational number, on the line whereas normally that would be uh, quite a difficult uh, idea. So that's the basic idea of the number line, and we can use them for showing whole numbers, uh, fractions, numbers with scientific notation, and so on. Um, ordinarily, of course, we use it with written symbols uh, next to the number, but for very young children who may not be totally secure in their knowledge of the symbols, they can use physical objects. They can even use their own bodies. So one idea which I recommend to teachers of very young children is to make a large number line on the floor using uh, masking tape would be ideal. Stick that on the floor and put markers at regular intervals along the line and have the students actually go and stand at locations on the line or go and write on the tape with a felt tip pen or uh, that sort of activity. So the standard at activity with a number line involves having a number line and either noting a particular point on the line and asking the students which number is uh, represented by that point, which one corresponds, corresponds to that location. Of course you need at least two points to be named already. Or to have the number line with a couple of points named and have the student go and tell you where a particular number is represented. So it's a great way for investigating students' understanding of place value, of fraction ideas, and that's common fractions or decimal fractions. For example, a common misconception even among young adults, research has shown about decimal fractions, is that some students believe that decimal fractions are on the opposite side of zero from the whole numbers. And there's a confusion there between decimal fractions and negative numbers. And there's a small but significant proportion of uh, people who've actually been shown to have that misconception. So a number line could uh, identify that sort of error. If you ask a student to show where a particular number is and they put it in an unusual place, you can investigate that further. I'd like to talk a little bit about how you could use a number line for computation lessons. Uh, curriculums all over the world, um, as to my knowledge, are expecting students to learn flexible methods of computation. 
uh, when I did my master's degree, I investigated students in years five, six, and seven using one of th or any of three methods: uh, written, mental, and calculator. There are other methods as well, of course, and, and there are flexible uses of mixtures of the two. Some sort of written method where you jot down notes and you do most of the work in your head, and there's approximations and exact answers and so on. My feeling is that traditional maths doesn't deal very well with flexibility or the approach that fosters flexibility in students' thinking because traditionally maths has come up with, uh, maths education this is, has come up with a particular method for solving a particular class of problem and then teachers have taught that particular method to students and trained them in it until they can get it right. And that suited a sort of industrial model for teaching math where students were going to go out and work in factories or shops and they needed to be able to compute answers correctly and exactly and quickly and you know not make mistakes and do it as fast as possible and so on. Times have changed. Not many people actually have to do that nowadays without some sort of uh, computational support from a calculator um, a cash register, a, a computer or whatever. But we do need students to understand what those numbers are and what the processes are that go on between the numbers. And so flexibility is emphasised in new curriculums. Um, in the syllabus that I'm most familiar with here in Queensland, uh, students are expected to explore written, mental and calculator methods, including student-generated methods. And it does mention also number lines specifically. So this idea of flexibility is built into the curriculum. So let's look at just some quick examples of the four operations and how you could use a number line. Starting with addition, supposing we had the question 26 plus 57. Now the standard traditional algorithm says you must line the numbers up vertically, lining up the ones and the tens. You must add the ones first because there might be some regrouping and of course there is. 6 plus 7 is 13. We've got enough to make a 10, carry the 10 and so on. Now a number line represents that addition question quite differently. The numbers are next to each other effectively, one after the other in a linear fashion obviously, uh, starting from zero and we want to know where is it along the line that we get to if we add these two numbers. So the question arises which you could ask your students do we have to start with 6 plus 7 if that's a method you've already used before? Or where would you like to start? Could we start with 20 plus 50? And of course the answer is yes. In fact, that might be an easy way to start. So we get the bulk of the answer recorded to start with. So add 20 plus 50. It's a nice simple extended number fact uh, giving a 70 and then add the 6 and the 7 um, after that. And so my approach to using that with a class would be to say here's a number line, how should we do it, have a discussion with students, maybe have students do it in groups and then ask them if there are other ways of doing it and ask them to explore the idea that when you do it in different ways if you're doing it correctly you will still get the correct answer and of course you can um, match that up with various mental methods and written methods and show how they all come to the same result. Let's look quickly at subtraction. 91 take away 46. Again, we don't have to start with the 1 and say, let's have 1 take away 6. What do we have to do? And we certainly don't necessarily have to do regrouping. We can start by taking away the 6. That might be a preferred way to do it. Start with 91, count back 6. Well, why don't we just count back 1 to start with because that takes us to 90. And then we have another, how many more? Five more, that'll take us to 85, and then count back 40. And you could do that 10 by 10, or all 40 at once, and so on. Multiplication, you can do multiple hops along a number line of a particular size. So you're doing, uh, using a repeated addition model for multiplication. It would be hard to do with a large multiplier. Um, you certainly wouldn't. Uh, it's not likely at least that you'd try doing you know, 25 times 37 because the numbers are simply too large. 
but you could certainly do something like 53 times 6 as another example. How are we going to do that? Well, you could do 53 and then count on another 53 and so on, do that six times, but that's going to be rather tricky and you almost have to know what the answer is before you start that. An alternative, of course, is to say, well, 53 is made of 50 and 3. Why don't we do six jumps of 50 to start with? And that's quite simple to represent on a number line. And then six jumps of 3. Could do six jumps of 3 first, but 650 just happens to come to 300, so that's a nice, neat one. All right. And lastly, we can do division. So if we had a nice uh, straightforward question like 80 divided by 4, you could have the students divide the number line from 0 to 80 into 4 equal parts because that works out nice and evenly. Um, and because it's 4, you could divide into halves first and then halve the, the halves themselves to make quarters and so on. With a harder question like 79 divided by 4, uh, it's probably simplest to count back how many jumps of four you would make and how many are left over and so on. So division is a little bit tricky, uh, but it can be used for the right question. Now each of these processes, these operations, will also work with decimal fractions quite nicely um, and even with common fractions. And that will raise all the questions that you'd have if you did it in a written algorithmic form, of course, using regrouping and with the, with uh, common fractions you'd have to do, common denominators and so on. All of those concepts will come up with a number line and all of those concepts can be dealt with and unpacked carefully so that students can understand it. So that concludes this discussion. Um, as in previous weeks, there is uh, a, a set of worksheets for you to download that go with this podcast. You'll need to go to our website for that. iTunes won't host that for us. So uh, do go to our website to get those. And, of course, we'd love you to leave uh, feedback on iTunes if you've enjoyed the show. And I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us at the Classroom Professor Math Podcast. You can contact me via email at peter at classroomprofessor.com and you can follow me on Twitter with the username peter underscore price. We'd love you to visit our website. It's classroomprofessor.com where we currently have the free ebook for download, 10 minutes a day, times tables worksheets. If you've enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and rate the show. And I look forward to speaking with you next time. Until then, goodbye.